session. Uh, okay, let's start again. Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, Summer Session Cup Seminar. It is uh, it's really a pleasure to have Professor Raul Jimenez uh, from Barcelona. Uh, Raul is, uh, is a long time uh, collaborator and friend, and we are very happy to and um, fortunate to have him visit in Champaign Urbana, and he also offered to uh, talk about some of his research. So Raul uh, got his PhD some time ago uh, in Copenhagen with uh, Bernard Pedro, and he actually worked in global clusters in astrophysics. And then he moved to the uh, University of Edinburgh, where he was a Royal Society Fellow with uh, John Peacock in the, uh, at some point in the 1990s, right? And then in the, in the 2000s, he was, uh, uh, he was faculty at Rutgers University, and then uh, he moved also to another faculty position in 10, and after that, uh, uh, Roman and, and their partner um, uh, moved to Barcelona, where they've been professor since 2008. And this is at, at ICREA, which is the uh, it's an institute inside the University of Barcelona, where Raúl is uh, is uh, has a chair of astrophysics. And Raúl works in a lot of things, you know, from uh, galaxy formation uh, to CMB cosmology, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, software development, uh, SED fitting, uh, stellar evolution, like the whole gamut. So in that sense, Raul is one of the most, you know, in my personal view, one of the most interesting theoretical astrophysicists that you can chat with because he has a very good grasp of, of what, and he, he has also been observing, but he, you know, I guess she has like a lot of trouble uh, staying up late at night. <laughs> so, but he has a good grasp of what can be predicted, what can be observed, and then what can be tested. So. Thank you very much for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here. It has been a pleasure to be back. I was here 20 years ago uh, at the wedding of my good friend, another good friend, Ben Mandel, who was a faculty here. And I, actually, I also gave a talk at the physics department. I don't know which direction it is, but uh, it was here. So the first question is uh, how many minutes do you want me to talk for? Less than an hour. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. I can talk to you less than an hour. <laughs> That's completely <laughs> fine. I don't want to make you laugh. Um, so I, I'm going to cover in my talk uh, what I have been working on for the last uh, three, four years, which is an approach to actually try to uh, develop modern independent cosmology. And the reason is the following, right? I show you here the Escher uh, picture engraving where everybody is very happily at the top of the ebony tower going around in circles without realizing if they have actually understood something or not. So I'm going to try to bring some ideas that I have developed with my students and postdocs on how to actually move forward. It's always good to see where we are because when I met Felipe in Cambridge, UK, certainly this was not the situation. We are in a situation nowadays where uh, we can describe every single observation in the universe with just uh, six numbers. Uh, the matter, the, 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 the energy densities, the expansion rate, and the two parameters that characterize uh, whatever the inflation is. Now, those are parameters, and there is a huge difference between describing and understanding. Those parameters tell you exactly how to build your model to actually reproduce the observations. But certainly we don't know what the dark energy is. We don't know what the dark matter is. But I also I like to point out that uh, in our current standard model of physics, of particle physics, we only know how to make photons. We don't know how to make particles. Because although we have some ideas about how to make uh, the matter and the matter asymmetry, there's nothing proven or described. So basically, we have a model that makes photons, <laughs> that is a uh, conundrum about what are the energy densities that we can So of course, the situation is very similar in the case of the inflaton, the, uh, because, uh, okay, we can describe the inflaton. We know the amplitude of the fluctuations. We know the tilt of the prime order power spectrum, but we don't know what the inflaton is. That's a huge uh, theme here in this house by the people leading the CMD experiments, they want to actually figure out what the scale of inflation is, that's the famous gravitational waves, and then bring some kind of uh, understanding of what is happening. So why, why do you say we don't know how to make matter? I mean, we, if 
We can Air say, produce. You know how that no, works. No, because the, you don't know how to actually uh, implement the matter and the matter asymmetry. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. Exactly. In um, your model. You have some ideas, but you don't know how to fulfill the Sakharov. Sorry, solution. you just mean the matter and matter agent. That's all I mean. Yeah, That's all I mean. That's all I mean. They said that if I took a regular my, matter, we don't know how to make regular matter. We, know, we don't know how to make a variable like this one here, right? right? Uh, we don't know how to make us uh, in, the, in, in our model, right? In our, our model shouldn't have uh, protons and neutrons. Yeah. They should be gone. Now, I'm going to try to bring you to some understanding of uh, how to approach the uh, origin of the, the, the physics of, this, uh, of these components. I also like to point out one thing that I think is very important when you try to do modeling the world. Because modeling is very special because we cannot make experiments. We only observe the sky. So the data are given. There is nothing else that uh, you have to use. So all the data have been provided for you. So the challenge is to extract the data, right? So we use our universe as a detector, and that detector is given. There's nothing you can do. You cannot go somewhere and observe from another point of the galaxy. We are doomed to be here. And now, as I said, to me, that's a blessing in the sense that observational cosmology should be a finished science. It should be an achievable science in the sense that uh, it should be possible to put all the data on the hard disk or on the web server and play with it. That has been done for the temperature of the CMD. There is no more data there, ever. There is no need to repeat that experiment because it's already cosmic balance limited, at least the primary system. Right? That's not the case with polarization, of course, but at least we have some ideas of how that has happened. So the question is, if you have all these data, all these rich data sets, how do you extract information? How do you get everything that there? But the only way to do that is actually to be a Bayesian. You have to be a Bayesian to actually uh, fit the model to the data. And that's what we do all the time, right? This uh, trivial formula, which is nothing but common sense and it is demonstrated in one line, uh, became very famous, it's called the Bayes theorem. And the only thing it's telling you is that uh, you get a weighted average of weighting of the data to actually um, assess if your theory is good or not. And there is something very crucial in how we're going to proceed forward for the following reason. So we can fit parameters and continue to fit parameters that we have been doing until now. But you really, what you really want to do is to decide which is the best model. To do that, you have to compute this thing called the evidence. And that evidence is the integral of the likelihood times the prior. So what is a prior and how do we use a prior? Now, let me illustrate this with an example because I want to give you several quizzes, right? Uh, this is the <coughs> quizzes. So let me give you an example that it is very clear. So I have a my observed data here, right? And they come on the line. And I have several models, M1, M2, M3. My question to you is which one is the correct one? So most people will answer that M1 is too simple because it doesn't generate the data. M3 is too complex because basically you encompass everything that it is there to be, uh, to be seen. <clears throat> and more people will say that uh, M2 is prior is just correct, okay? Now, see the question here, but actually you cannot see because it is sort of hidden by, the, by this window. But you see that the prior multiplies the likelihood. You can never get rid of the prior in model selection. We, we can hide that. Uh, yes, I tried that, but... Uh, you can't the uh, yeah. yeah, look what's happening. Yep, yeah, right. Now click. Uh, it uh, it's okay. That's fine. It's not going to bother me. Just bother okay. me. Uh, so why is M2 just right? How did you choose the prior? This is an open question. In fact, nobody knows how to choose the prior. 
And I think this is one of the things that are going to become very, very, uh, it's a huge active field of research for mathematicians that are trying to figure out how to <coughs> survive. But this is something that we're going to face very soon when we start to see that uh, somebody very smart will develop something that it is as good as one as in the end, fits the data, you get the parameters, and then you say which one of the two should they choose. So that's uh, something that uh, is going to be uh, a very interesting uh, field of research. And if I have time, I will talk about that, applied to uh, trying to determine the neutrino hierarchy from the data in the sky. But uh, a prior should reflect our state of belief before the data arrived. Uh, I would argue, or what I have been arguing, is that uh, you should use the physics the same way we use synergies to build our Lagrangian. You should do the physics to actually construct your pride. But if you are talking about the social sciences, science, uh, the social sciences. If I'm trying to describe human interactions, right, asymmetries is maybe not a very good idea to describe that. But then you would have to choose something. So all this continues, right? And you say, okay, I'm going to describe my theory. I'm going to use my theory to describe the data. I'm going to uh, actually uh, build my models. I'm going to collect my data. But then you come to a point which I call coincidences. So let me give you a quiz. I woke up this morning at Felipe's house. I wanted to make coffee. And I found that at the edge of the countertop, there were a couple of grains of coffee. My question to you is, what is the rest of the bag of coffee? Yeah. Not there. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, it's not there, but what is it? In the cabinet, in the drawer. So that's one, that's one, that's one solution. Then you say that uh, Felipe's son woke up in the morning, took out two grains of coffee, put them exactly at the edge of the counter top, and left them there. That's called a uh, fine tuning. The other, the other option is that actually the bag of coffee is filled out and it's floor, and you just got a few grains there, right? So the answer is Java mm -hmm. of the right picture. There is a round thing, and somewhere there is Java. Ah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, the other two coincidences <laughs> that I wanted to show to you are the following, and I think they are interesting, and what I'm trying to bring to you is the following question. So, um, there are total eclipses of the sun, right? And the only reason is that the angular size of the moon and the sun are the same. Um, there is also as much water as uh, land on Earth. Um, and that's also a coincidence. Nobody, I, I hope, in developing a theory, a fundamental theory, to explain why the moon is exactly at the right distance for us, human beings, to see total, total eclipses of the sun. The same way, on Earth, the contrast between the, the land and the bottom of the sea is very small. It's just a kilometer, more or less, right? So that happened only because there are coincidences. And the most likely explanation is that uh, uh, you are sampling from a multiverse of planets. You know, you just have so many planets around that you just happen to be here. So the question is, at what time do we stop trying to explain things? At what time are we in the Sorry about the word, the, 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 the M word, multiples. At what point, you know, we don't have to explain anymore what's happening. And the only thing that we see is actually <coughs> coincidences. I think these things are going to become very, very important as the data increase. So I'm going to discuss some ideas about model independent cosmology that, uh, that I'm actually uh, pursuing to try to circumvent this necessity to rely on the model, right? And I will talk about some of them. So first, as I said, it is possible to do ultimate experiments in cosmology because we have done that, right? The Planck has collected all the information about temperature and isotropies, primary ones, that there are in the skies, right? And there's nobody, no way that we're going to move to the other side of the galaxy to beat cosmic bubble. And there is a huge effort, huge effort ongoing here to actually make characterize the polarization, which is something where we have an exhausted the signal. But eventually, we're also going to do the same with the same. It's not only that, the same is happening in the field of galaxy 
uh, clustering where the number of galaxies that we're collecting uh, from the sky is increasing linearly with that uh, with that power law. And uh, now the current experiment that is going on is DESI is collecting the spectra for million, 30 million galaxies. So we are going to do basically the same to is actually to collect some information. So what I want to do is to say, if I have all the information in the sky, what can I learn about nature, about, this, about the, the loss of nature? So when I told you that those six parameters describe everything in the universe, that basically can go to a computer and stimulate the universe and get that, I was a bit uh, lying because of course there are two tensions. There are two things that people don't understand and they're basically um, a discordance between the early universe and the late universe. That one of those is the less famous sigma A tension <coughs> and the other one was the H not tension. So let me just recall what is happening here. So what is happening here is the following. You take the CMB or the, or the early universe and you fit a model, in this case, the lambda system. That model gets uh, the best fitting parameters and then you extrapolate it all down to zero because you believe that the correct model is better in the universe. Now, if that's the case, then when you do local observations that don't depend on the cosmic macro background in physics, either the two things agree and you have the correct model describing the universe, or they disagree, and then you have a tension, and then you have new physics, or you have systematic errors, or there's something that you don't understand. So when you do that for the, so sigma it is the amount of fluctuations at the scale, in the scale of the capacity. So basically it's just how much fluctuations you have, right? How smooth the universe is. The bigger this number, the more uh, clustering there is, the smaller that number, the smoother the universe is. And what is happening is that if you look at Planck, there is more clustering than when you look at the lensing, at the weak lensing at low energy. Of course, this is like very, very mild tension, right? About the two and a half sigma or something like that. But you know, it's something to keep in mind because there may be windows into, into, uh, into and the same happens with the Hubble constant, right? When you take the CMB, you calculate what the Hubble constant should be, assuming a flat lambda CDM model, extrapolated forward, then people measure it with the basically the distant ladder locally. And what they find is a discrepancy, is that the early universe is here and the late universe is here. And depending who you talk to, who you believe this thing oscillates between a three sigma or a six sigma discrepancy. Something to take seriously, right? Of course, you may tell me that uh, this Hubble parameter has not been, it has has a very flat history because uh, it has been something that has been converted, right? Uh, so the situation there is a bit, uh, a bit complicated because this uh, Hubble parameter depends on time. I don't want to say more about that, but just let me just uh, tell you or just recall that there are these kind of uh, discrepancies in the distance ladder, right? That is all the way going from a uh, redshift zero where we are to the early universe. I want to say something because now it is very common to actually talk about this Hubble tension and characterize it. We were actually the first one that actually quantify this tension uh, doing some, uh, some uh, actually quite uh, quite interesting uh, statistics uh, to, uh, to say more about that. So let me go a bit to the science to be a bit more the quantitative about what we can do. So one thing that you can do when you have all these kind of uh, uh, tensions is to look for alternative methods that don't depend on the cosmological model. So the same way the local distance doesn't uh, depend on the cosmology, because basically what you are doing is measuring first trigonometry and then going through the, through the different standard candles. There is something that we realized was uh, extremely interesting and that's connected to my original PhD on stellar ages. 
And there is a triviality that you can write down for a Freeman uh, metric, for a Freeman Russell Walker metric, that uh, the time is delta redshift divided by the Hubble quadrant. So if you are able to measure redshifts and time, automatically you get the redshift. Now, why is this yeah. interesting? Hey, somebody on there needs a mute now. Now, why is this interesting? Well, you are going to see that it is interesting for uh, several reasons. The first one is that you are going to measure the Hubble parameter without relying on any cosmology candidate, right? You will rely only on very basic uh, uh, assumptions about homogeneity and isotropy, and I will come back to that. But then, if you want to measure how time passes, that's basically nuclear physics. If you are able to extract a clock from the burning of hydrogen into, into helium in the stars, that's all you care about. That's like a marker that has been sitting there. And then it doesn't care about what your expansion history is. These are, of course, fully nonlinearized objects. Let me recall, though, that when we are doing that, we are looking, when you are trying to measure the expansion history, what you are doing is to look into the surface of the past light probe, right? That's what we see. When you take observations of galaxies, or when you take observations of, uh, of the cosmic microwave background, the only thing you do is to actually measure here, and what you want to do is how this cone, the, the surface of the past light cone, uh, uh, enhances. And that's fine, that's what we have been doing in cosmology. But I'm going to challenge you and to say that what I want to do actually is to look uh, inside the past light cone. And that's going to prove homogeneity, which is an assumption in the current model. I'm going to show you a technique to look outside the light cone, which uh, seems to be impossible, but actually you can do it. And that will prove the so-called multiverse if you can look outside. And of course, the future is what we do in physics, right? We're supposed to have the correct laws of physics so we can break what the future is. So let me just say focus on the fast and the outside the light cone and then walk you through the data. So let's go back to this equation. Now, this go back to when Felipe and I met. Felipe was working on elliptical galaxies and uh, I was working on galaxy evolution at the same, at that time. And we were trying the big debate at that time is whether or not these galaxies were forming a redshift 10, redshift 5, or redshift 1, right? But uh, from this formula, to give you a measurement of H of C, what I want to do is to find a way to measure delta T, right? If I have a quiescent population of the stars, that are evolving with time and sitting there like markers, like, a, like a beacons on the, on the universe, then I should be able to use this formula and give you H of C. And that's what I'm going to do, actually. So, you know, I didn't bring you here to measure time. I'm actually going to provide you with a measurement of H of Z. So how do you do this? Well, it became clear, uh, you know, very quickly that there are a subpopulation of a subpopulation of elliptical galaxies that actually are formed very early on. You know, this is a, some color color, this astronomical uh, representation. You don't care about that. This is the region where the galaxies are, so the galaxies are the red points. These lines are theoretical models where the formation ratio of these galaxies is. And you don't need to do any Bayesian statistics to know that the points are up there, not in the bottom. Right, and all of that we agree that these points are actually here. That is, they form very early on, actually five, actually four. And then these kind of objects don't have any farther star formation activity, right? So these are like uh, old people that have been born uh, very early on, right? And they have been aging, nothing else. That's all they have been doing, right? Nothing else at all. There are more evidence from other lines. I don't want to bore you with that. That's completely relevant. But something that I think is relevant to Felipe, uh, finding these kind of galaxies is very difficult. 
and that's why Jimmy Sanders. Because this is a, the lower world that political analysis were all red and dead. And Felipe actually showed that that's not the case, but there are some of them that are still are. So in order to select these galaxies, you have to go through all this, uh, this flow chart to actually select which galaxies have the, the good one, okay? So see how the game, uh, the game uh, is being played. And I think it is very interesting. So all these uh, theoretical relations, you can actually transform them into a pure observational measurement. So to measure the age of a stellar population, you want to determine the gravity and the temperature of the star. That's what is giving you if the star, because young stars are very bright, all stars are very faint. So you want to see exactly what you got. So a good tracer, extremely good tracer of gravity and temperature is this uh, length of lines. It is called the 4,000 break. It is made of calcium lines. And it is basically because the opacity is sensitive to the, to the width of that, of the, of the age. So basically, if you measure that quantity, D4000, that's actually a measurement of age of C of the Hubble parameter. So look at this. These are observational spectra, right? And this is the quantity that you have to look at. That. A reshift point eight, this break is very small, while a reshift point two, the break is huge. But all like this is that those are all like the digital of the classes, right? Those are like and these are identically these are I'm going to say my next slide is actually answering your question, right? These are gigantic objects. And also, even if you select like a service that are like targeted to very Poetian galaxies, these are only like one one percent of the population. This is really, really the tip of the iceberg. These are the only ones that survive that are my markers, right? So I can do that. I cannot plot D4000 as a function of redshift and as a function of mass, right? Velocity is a function of mass. But you see that they all follow the trend. It is this number is higher here than a higher redshift. Yes. I have maybe any question. Is there under underlying stellar evolution model we actually use? Because our stellar evolution models are calibrated for Milky Way, yes, and for stars. Of course, stars. of course. So, so I, I need to, well, I need some information, right? I cannot get information from nothing, right? So I can take a stellar evolution model, and this is telling me here how that model evolves for D4000 as a function of metallicity of the population, right? The metal content. And then these are the uncertainties from very different models. The only thing I'm using is I want a tag that is related to the age of the star and evolves linearly with this uh, with this uh, mark. Right? That's the only thing I do. And there are different of those, right? At the end of the day, I want to put this number into kilometers per second per megaparsec. Then I have to use a stellar evolution. Okay. Then I have to actually model how the stars evolve as a function of time. But just the stars, nothing else. Stars are complicated. They are not. I completely disagree. The stars are extremely simple. And if we you, already have been there. If, if you use different, I don't know, if you use MISA or something, if you use different conversion length parameter, you have different tracks. For actually, example. that's not true, because that's actually very well uh, constrained. But so so this is, these galaxies, are dominated by main sequence stars of about one solar mass. The envelope will be convective, and it is true, you have a parameter called the mixing length that is going to tell you how much the turbulence is going to be there. But that's something you can actually calibrate from observation. It's not free. For Milky Way stars, not for stars. Ah, okay, no, no. Of course, I'm assuming the Copernical principle, you know. Like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that the laws of physics are the same here and everywhere else. Chemical composition is different, not physics. Ah, no, no, but that's fine. That, I can determine that. Actually, I'm going to show you that I can get markers that are insensitive to the chemical composition. Okay. And I get the same trend. 
Maybe this was an open that you described, but how would you know that an old elliptical galaxy has several mergers? So, like, you have a picture of because because uh, you have to fit for that. So, uh, so that, that's the, the, the flow chart, right? And this is the selection that allows you to actually pick up the ones without underlying star formation. So, you have to fit for that. That's something you can fit for. You can actually look for what is the level of star formation activity that these things have. You have a full spectrum. You have a full spectrum with very high uh, signal to noise. So, one of the things that you have to recall is that to play this game, I need very good data. So I need to have very high signal to noise and very good spectral resolution to fit for what you are saying. That I don't have, you have to fit for. Interlinear stars and heterolinear stars, you would see them because the. You will see them because there are several signatures that show up, right? Like the emission lines or the, the, the continuum doesn't look the same. But you see, uh, with intention, I was coming here from the ultraviolet all the way down to the to the infrared. Then you really need a lot of data to do this game. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So, so the previous slide is your selection function, and then these are the ones that have. They're good. They're good. There are some examples of that. No, no, these are some examples. These are just some. Okay. okay. There are many more. There are okay. many more than these, right? Because I have millions to yeah. select. You know, and are these typically BCGs or they're just. The gigantic yeah, BCG, that's typical. Okay, they're all BCGs. These are yeah. like a enormous, uh, enormous galaxy. And, and what instrument was this? Sorry? What instrument was this? Ah, this is like multitude of, uh, of instruments. So this has been collected from the Sloan uh, survey from the KEC, uh, BLTs, uh, basically everywhere. Very, very different. Basically, we're going to piggyback on all surveys that have done spectroscopy. Even these spectra here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, most of those are not on Sloan. No, no, no. These are not. These are like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the selection was presumably down. I mean, it's not no, the selection. No, so Sloan gives you the lower redshift, and then you want to move into higher redshift. So you start to collect uh, from other surveys like Cosmos or the Z Cosmos. Uh, those are DLTs. Uh, then you complement it with the. Uh, so the way you do the selection is that first you start with surveys that have not only a spectroscopy. But far infrared uh, photometry and uh, near infrared, near UV photometry. So you can have a gigantic level array to make sure there's no dust or for the star formation. So it's a collection of surveys, basically. Okay, so you did, okay, I was in the impression that you selected them with the spectra and then went and got better spectra. But no, no, you just no, okay. no. You select uh, whatever, for this project, we didn't do anything ourselves. Okay. Whatever people do, we collect it. Okay. So we look into this, uh, the bigger the survey, the better for us, but it is important that there is a spectra to actually produce this measure. And then why at, um, uh, why at low velocity dispersion does it turn over the, and the, ne the next slide? And uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, why at low, uh, low Z, low velocity? Because these are not good. You want to have massive galaxies. This was to illustrate that as you get to lower and lower masses, you have more possibility for mergers or uh, ah, okay. so you really want to stick to the very massive okay. galaxies. Yeah. As you get to lower and lower masses, then you start to have a, 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 a worse and worse thing. Basically, and you can identify that these points start to be dominated by a, a recent star formation or some recent merger or some recent like you know yeah. burst. Or so this is kind of anecdotal evidence for cosmic downsizing right here, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. It's not actually, it's not anecdotal. It's actually, uh, it's actually exactly what is happening. When you analyze the whole survey, and I reconstruct the star formation history, mm -hmm. you see that the low masses keep having star formation all the time, mm -hmm. while the high masses die off very quickly. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can actually, actually, you can actually do the downsizing from this data and show mm -hmm. that this happened. Now, one thing, I, one thing I want to point out is regarding the chemical com composition is that there are actually features in the spectrum that are uh, extremely weakly dependent on the metallicity. One of those is the H beta. Maybe you don't care what that is, it's relevant, right? But uh, look at this plot here. So, red is high redshift, yellow, lower, green, and blue. You do see here, and this feature depends only on the on the age. 
is the weakest uh, metallicity sensitive uh, line in the world in leaky indices. That you, you do see the trend here. You do see the trend that the universe is younger at higher redshift than it is at lower redshift. So at the end of the day, I will have to, co to put this into a, a kilometers per second per megaparsec, right? So I have to do a conversion that takes me from these indexes. And actually, what we do is a full fitting to the, to, the, to the real thing. So let me do that. Yes. Quick follow up question. Yes. Do you need stellar mass function to generate these profiles? You do. You do. But I can show you the full covariance matrix at the end. Okay. So that's taking into account. That's a very good point. And you do. Of course, you do. You do the metallicity, you need the stellar mass function. You also need the models, right? <coughs> because, as you said, the models are not perfect. It's not like the CMB that we have one model, or at least the model is below 0.05% systematics, right? So we take all that into account. So, of course, of course, it is very important. So, Raul, I'm confused about the H beta. Yeah. So what I see from there is that uh, there's, a, there's a clear gradient in H yes. for how H beta looks. But we always know that there's a, you know, there's this uh, degeneracy between H and metallicity. So no, not in H beta. And how do you know that that's not metallicity? Because, because, so H beta is the one that tracks H most than anything. Ah, uh, okay. It's the one, that's why I show you. Oh, because of table six. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So this is the law. So the zero will be perfect uh, age tracking. Perfect, that's perfect, right? Uh, if you look at the other indices, they are more dependent on the metallicity. Okay, and this is the different models. That's from the Woodley 19. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Different models. I want to show you that that's actually, uh, uh, we were very careful to take that into account. Let me show you some results, right? Because uh, now I can go ahead and show you how this looks like. So actually, this is the first plot that it is completely cosmology model independent that shows a transition between uh, deceleration and acceleration. Those uh, orange points are the are the Hubble parameters recovered with this method, and this will be the fit to a model with no transition. So you can actually build this uh, this. Uh, this uh, uh, H of C things, right? And, uh, and actually show how the, how the, how the universe is uh, changing from deceleration to acceleration. And with it, yeah. So that higher right to the point, does it take a size for up to 0.7? So, so they are coming from different surveys that what people were collecting, right? So, uh, I wasn't exhausted on showing uh, all the details here, but all the, I can I can look it up. What is the survey that these uh, high redshift uh, points are coming from? I think mostly are coming from the Z cosmos. Some point. Uh, I don't make that assumption. I don't make that assumption. I don't make that assumption. So we measure the metallicity for every single object by doing a full fitting to the spectrum. Okay. So what do we fit? We fit for the for the metallicity, we fit for the star formation history, and we fit for the age. Okay. Exactly. I'm doing the full fitting. And then from there, I select those galaxies that have a given metallicity that I derive, and they have no star formation. I force them to for me not to detect any, any significant star formation. Those are the only ones I keep. If they have star formation, I throw them away. And then I just take uh, the full fitting to determine the age of the thing. Okay. That, that's, that's, that's all you do. So you're directly into the ages that are Exactly, exactly, exactly. You basically, but I thought it's very interesting to show that from the data only you can construct this relationship. That there is no, at the, at the end, you rely on the on the models to actually put kilometers per second per megaparsec, right? That it is what it is, uh, what it is happening here. Right? What, sorry, what is the pump band? Thing? What is it? Pump. The yellow band for pump is showing. That's a transition, right? So you do, when you when when Planck fits uh, 
the lambda CDF model, all right? Uh, that's the transition between deceleration and acceleration, assuming the lambda CDF model, right? So this is the 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 the, the, the Planck model is is telling you where that transition is happening, right? And this is our best result, adding adding the boss spectra or not adding the boss spectra that becomes worse. But if you add the boss spectra, you do see that you get a significant uh, one, two, three sigma uh, detection of that transition. Now that does not depend at all on the on the on the on the cosmological assumption. Doesn't depend at all. This thing doesn't depend on those cosmology effects. So it's surprising, or maybe not surprising, that uh, that uh, that I'm actually uh, getting exactly the same as the lambda city of it. The roles of that Planck uh, turnover that's 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 actually coming from the Planck data and the feet, or is it from well, the Planck and the feet? Okay, but it's not an assumption. The Planck model. They don't assume that that's the way. No, no, they don't assume that that's, that's the right. Well, they take the lambda CDM model, right? So they have okay. they have some omega lambda, they have some omega macro, right? And then they use they use uh, the lensing of the CMB or the large scale structure because they cannot do it only with the CMB. And then they see that there is omega lambda 0.7 uh, or and there is omega polar matter 0.3. If you put that, then automatically okay. yes. you already see fast as transition. So so it's uh, it's a uh, he said, so uh, I guess I have talked for almost uh, 40 minutes and I haven't covered much. So let me just go and see and, see and say a few things about things that I think that are quite exciting. There's actually, you can use something similar to this to look inside the past life. So one of the assumptions of the model is homogeneity that we use the file, that we use. Uh, to describe our metric. So see, uh, isotropy is very well constrained from the CMB, right? Because you are looking on the surface of the past light from a different positions. And actually you are seeing that that uh, that uh, thing is the same, whatever you do. But that only constrains isotropy to constrain a homogeneity, you have to look actually inside the past light. And for that galaxies are fantastic because galaxies are a fossil record, right? It's coming to us with information when these objects were close to each other. So if you look at the characteristics about how they move from the patch light cone into the surface of the patch light cone, you can actually figure out if these things look similar or different. And this is the only constraint so far on the homogeneity of the universe. And we put a constraint there at 5%. So our claim is that the universe is homogeneous with 5% of this. There's another thing that you can do, which I thought it was interesting, is which actually to look outside the past light cone. So how do you do that? Well, you do this by constraining the curvature. So the curvature, if you live in an extremely flat universe, Imagine that as omega k is zero, strictly, then it will be perfectly flat. If you put the flag there, it will be a bit curved. Right? Now, if you put a rock next to us, then it will curve, and then you will have the measurement of curvature. The way it is done now with Planck is again, you assume the lambda CDM model and you fit for a parameter within that. But, but there are a couple of interesting things. This is a completely model independent because we have independent problem. So if you are able to measure the L and the Hubble parameter, you can get the omega curvature. Um, the L, to measure it in a model in a cosmology more independent way, you can do it with the gravitational waves, with the dark silence whenever they come along. This is not a very easy thing to do, it's a futuristic thing from BBO. Uh, if I measure the whole parameter, then from there I can get the mega curvature. So what is the goal? The golden standard. The golden standard will be to measure 10 to the minus 5, because that's what inflation predicts. Inflation tells you that, uh, that the fluctuations are at that level, and therefore you are living in a very big patch, in a small patch that was stretched out 
by inflation. If you measure anything bigger than that, it means that this inflation is not very good at doing that, and inflation doesn't work. Or even more interesting, if you actually live in a place that it is much flatter than 10 to the minus 5, then also inflation doesn't work. So this will be an, an, an alternative way to actually figure out if inflation is the correct framework or not completely. But, and in the paper, we actually calculated if you could get to 10 to the minus 5 or not, and the answer was yes, that basically, if you can combine futuristic experiments um, from the future, future, I'm, I'm really saying PPO, so it must be like a 30 years away or 20 years away, you can actually do these experiments. So, um, so in, sorry, so what if there is a negative term? So inflation will be a 10 to the minus 5. That's the point. Oh I have to check it out. I don't remember what it's called. So, to measure 10 to the minus 5, you need a sigma DL of 1 in 1,000. Oh. 1, 1 percent. Okay. No, no, this is very futuristic. Very futuristic. But uh, we are measuring nano Kelvin in the same event. Yeah, but the minimum of the air comes from the visual waves. So yeah. That's not the same. It's, 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 it's,
and all these other things. You know, people like Pirata and all these people. And then just do what I started to build these codes for doing that, right? There's something that we have been there. It's only that there is very easy to build uh, to solve the problem, right? But here is the uh, issue. So just let me say one thing. Recently, um, I came back to the issue of uh, globular cluster ages, uh, the thing that I did in my PhD. So of course, you can take that equation at the beginning, take the integral, and that will be your automatic equation. Now, how do I estimate that? Well, you estimate that from this obvious from globular clusters, which only contain all the stars. And what we did was something very Bayesian, which actually, uh, I don't know how much you know about this field, but what people have done in this field is to use a single point on the color magnitude diagram, which is the Mexico standoff, and basically by eye, move it up and down the models and see which one was fitting better, right? What we said is that actually, you look at the full color magnitude diagram, and there are the other 10 to the four stars there, you see that the dependence on age, metallicity, metallicity and distance is very different depending on which part of the diagram you're looking at. So for example, look at here, of course the age is maximally dependent on the main sequence turn off, but the metallicity is coming from the red giant branch and also the south giant branch. So what David Balsam did, he's uh, actually he's nearby in Ohio, uh, now as a postdoc, was to do that with the new data. The data have improved tremendously over 30 years, yes, already 30 years, since I did this thing. Um, uh, there is now HST data, there is phenomenal uh, data for that, and we computed, again, with a lot of care about the statistics, this age of this universe. Let me cut uh, to the chase. One of the most exciting things is that uh, from that method, we can actually derive distances, because that's a parameter for us. And the most exciting thing is that actually those distances that we derive agree with the Gaia ones. So Gaia can also derive distances in a trigonometric way. And the, one of the big uncertainties in this business that was to actually estimate the distance that we were clustered is something that we cannot play. So we were very happy about that. Wait, wait, wait. How does it come close to the air bars are, that seems crazy that you're as close as parallax. Seems unphysical. No. No, because now you are using the full color model. And that's the and that's the thing. Um, um, you were throwing all the information, there are 10 to the four points there. You were taking one basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're taking one. And that's what people were and this is the first time ever that this thing has been done. Like an improvement of the number of points that you actually use. Basically, right. So this Basically. is only used in the global cluster, not the other stars. It yeah, really well with global cluster. Yeah, that's the only ones that I know mm -hmm. because. Yeah, yeah. But I can add, actually in the feed, we also fit it for multiple populations and computed the oldest one because some clusters have different chemical composition. So we can actually fit also for the for the alpha enhanced elements, right? For the neutron capture elements. So the reason that we can obtain distances is because now you are having this kind of luminosity function that has uh, features, right? So you are moving things back and forth, back and forth. And these features is basically an anchor, while the age is a kind of modulation of these features. So you are able to fit for, the, for those things. So we did that, and then I can show you how that, what, what that is telling us on the on the on the on the Hubble tension, because I think that's a very interesting thing. So, what is the problem with the Hubble tension? The problem is the following: uh, and you compute uh, you compute the sum horizon in the Hubble tension by using that formula that I write down a little bit, right? Uh, that's how you do it in Planck. Now, that formula is everything there is model dependent. Everything. Everything you need to decide what is the Hubble parameter at the matter radiation graph. You need to decide what kind of a species you have. You have photons, so you have something else. In fact, people modify that to solve the Hubble tension. They just say, okay, instead of photons, let me put early dark energy, let me put something, right? 
and then I move it like a dog. So it's not true that this sound horizon is something given by God. It is something that uh, you choose. It's a model that you choose. So when you do that, you put the sound horizon, the ruler, early version of the Howard parameter, you find yourself in catastrophe because choose is the C phase, the local model. The CMB is aligned here with the BAO you cut, so you are cutting here instead of here, and that's the issue. That's the problem that you have. These things should come together. These things should have been here. It's not here. There are not two points. Now on that plot, I can push the globular clusters because I have an age, and therefore I have a flower parameter. So if I do that, and that's something that also Luis Lagnal did, uh, uh, he's now a postdoc in, uh, in, uh, in Baltimore, moving to Mass Planck in a few months. You have the situation that, look at these lines. So this is the, 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 the BAO line. This is where the orange series were plant cuts, and that's very close to that. This is the Adam Rees value. This is Wendy Freeman. You know, that depends you can, uh, Wendy Freeman's value of this. So there's no problems with the Adam Rees value, right? The globular clusters are the blue line, actually the dashed line. And they are with plant. So if I take the global cluster seriously, they are telling me that there is no tension. That's interesting. Uh, wait, uh, it's not precise enough, right? It's not precise enough to rule out this point. That's what you're saying. I cannot rule this point at five or six months. Yes. No, that's not. Uh, I cannot. So it's a two and a half sigma uh, mm -hmm. ruling out this thing. This is the point where they are, that's the plant point, but they like to be sitting on plant more than down there mm -hmm. at, the, at the current position that we have. Actually, that error bar, if you look at the clusters, uh, you see that this fully dominated by systematics. It's actually coming from the uncertainty in the nuclear rates. If somebody in a laboratory decided somewhere to improve those nuclear rates, we could do much better. Hmm. Now, to do that is very difficult because this is a lot of work. And I don't know if people want to do that. But, uh, but just let me finish. I promise now, let me just finish. And I'm going to finish with a small rant. So when I did my PhD in the 90s, I was working on stellar ages because I wanted to, go to, to figure out what the universe was like. And then I remember with these stellar ages, we came to the conclusion in that uh, article in 1995 that uh, the universe was dominated by life. And nobody believed me. Nobody believed me. They thought uh, the stars are very complicated. I remember Sol Permuter used to go around saying, this must be wrong because my data from the supernova are saying that omega matter is one. So, of course, uh, by not believing, I missed my Nobel Prize because uh, the omega lambda was there much before, much before that. So I think the lesson I learned is that uh, it is important to look at things with precision and with interest because, uh, as I said at the beginning, the signal in the universe is limited. We don't have more data. We don't have the chance to actually do more experiments. And the only thing we can do is to actually uh, understand that signal to the limit, you know. So let me conclude here. Uh, it seems to me that the Lambda CDM model seems to be in very good shape. Uh, be too conservative, and you will miss the next disruption of physics. And you know, all these things that I have been uh, listing, um, the, the thing is very exciting because now we're moving into this survey mode. What we're doing is like collecting all the data that there are in the universe. So I think it's going to be exciting to understand what the physics of the universe is and move forward from there. Let's stop here and take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. When you're talking about 
much the multiverse stuff. What does that mean? Like, physically, how do you look outside like, our universe outside? Well, basically, they are looking outside by proxy, right? I'm looking outside, but uh, if I was in this uh, table, and uh, at the moment this is going in, in, in a causal contact, somebody was bending the table, right? I will end up with a bended table, right? So if I look very tiny, uh, very, with very low accuracy, I would think the table is flat. But if I look with very, very uh, high accuracy, then I realize that the table is bent. Right? Now, this thing was happening when the things were in cash flow contact, right? But now they are not. They are like uh, far away, right? So that's how I'm looking on site. Uh, you're not really looking at like multiverses. You're looking at things outside of your local place. Exactly. So it's not quite the same thing. As it's not quite the same, but it's the only way. And uh, that's why it was quote unquote multiverses. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's just, not like there's bubble universes and you know which connect. No, because that's those are never in class Exactly. And they're exponentially, exponentially disconnected. Actually. Exactly. So, so no, no, they no. no. Uh, you have to be at some point the information must have been transmitted to you, right? Yes. But is that the only thing that they talk about? Like you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, since you can measure the the curvature within your horizon, right? You can look about how much is talking about this. So we know there is a limit to that. It's 10 to the minus 5 or something. So if inflation is correct, because that's the that's the amount of uh, differences that it, because there are curvature fluctuations, right? That's what you put there at that point, right? Now you measure something else like 10 to the minus 1 or 10 to the minus 2. And something else must have happened because uh, inflation doesn't do it. More interesting, I think, would be you go to 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 7, right? And then you find yourself in an extremely flat. And then it is, uh, it would be something different. I think my point was that I think it would be interesting to measure it with our line on the model. Because now we just assume that the CDM and say, okay, let's fit all the mega -pay. And then, of course, you get very good constraints, but that's under the assumption. I mean, it's related to your question when you said, well, is it the only way to do this? Can it be something else? I think it would be interesting to measure it uh, in a cosmology or in the kind of way. Any questions online? Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. I don't know what is there. I don't know what I told him. What a typical access for global cluster, but they could be 